President Trump has been we've we've he's been a protectee of the Secret Service since approximately 2015 2016 when he declared his presidency for the first time ever since then he has had a routine behavior and predictability and the fact that he lives between Mar-a-Lago in West Palm uh, Florida and uh, Bedminster New Jersey uh, uh, during other months and occasionally early on uh, he was in, in New York as well uh, but when he comes to Mar-a-Lago for example he plays golf regularly, and it doesn't take a, 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 a brain surgeon uh, to watch the news, to do very little work and determine that he's regularly appearing at golf courses and golfing when he's in Mar-a-Lago. I have ordered a paradigm shift. The Secret Service's protective methodologies work, and they are sound, and we saw that yesterday. But the way we are positioned right now in this dynamic threat environment, it has given me guidance to say, you know what, we need to look at what our protective methodology is. We need to get out of a reactive model and get to a readiness model. Welcome to another episode of Counterculture, the show that stands at the intersection of reason and faith in the battle against sentimentality. It's deja vu all over again after President Trump survived another assassination plot where a would-be shooter was able to get within 500 yards of Trump before a Secret Service agent was able to intervene. The Secret Service needs to get out of a reactive model and into a readiness model, said Acting Director Ron Rowe in the aftermath. What does that mean? How about a common sense model? One in which the Secret Service devotes the planning and the resources commensurate to the looming threat. Both Rowe and President Biden said one of the Secret, Service, Secret Service's necessary needs is more personnel. But I'd like to hear the case for how many they say they need and why and how the additional personnel fit into this paradigm shift Rowe suggested he is going to initiate. These are the same sorts of explanations we demand of local police departments when they make such asks. Rowe touted Secret Service's recent successes, the RNC, the DNC, the debate, the state's uh, visit of Israel Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. But the instances where the agency has done its job cannot overcome inexplicable failures like Butler that revealed apparent culture problems within the agency, like an emphasis over the identity of agents rather than their quality. Roe has yet to speak to those issues and was defensive when he was challenged on them in a congressional hearing after the near assassination of Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania. So here we are again, trying to get answers from the Secret Service and FBI while groping for some reason to believe these federal law enforcement agencies should enjoy the benefit of the doubt as to both their competence and integrity. To zero in on the important questions to be answered about the attempt on the former president at his golf course in West Palm, the questions that remain about Butler and the course correction Secret Service should make, we're pleased to be joined by Mike Olson, who served in the Secret Service for 22 years and was also, was also in local law enforcement as a police officer in St. Paul, Minnesota. Mike Olson is now in the private security business with a firm he co-founded called 360 Security Services, which specializes in investigations, cybersecurity, and risk management. Mike, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Glad to be here with you today, Dan. So in that um, briefing that Acting Director Ron Rowe gave, he, he basically said that Secret Service is going to make a paradigm shift from reactive to readiness which will include hard conversations about necessary needs that will allow the Secret Service to be successful every day. That sounds like sort of the word salad you expect from a, a candidate for political office. I, I really, I have no idea what any of that actually means taken in totality. So perhaps you could decipher Secret Service talk for us. So um, apparently it's new language since I left the agency, Dan. Okay. Um, we, we, we were not an agency of reaction. We are an agency of proactive uh, risk assessment and protection. And you can't provide protection when you're in a reactive mode only. Uh, that, that's then called incident response, and it comes after bad things happen. So to be quite frank, I, I've been baffled by some of the things that have come out um, of the top echelon of the Secret Service over the last several months. And I can't define that for you because it doesn't compute uh, with my time there at the Secret Service. Something else Rose said, he basically said, um, we had a plan with respect to this off book 
event, Trump playing golf at his golf course. We had a we had a plan and that plan succeeded. It was almost like he was taking a victory lap. Is is that appropriate? In in my humble opinion, no. And the reason is is one of the operative words that's been left out of that statement is predictability. President Trump has been we've we've he's been a protectee of the Secret Service since approximately 2015 2016 when he declared his presidency for the first time. Ever since then, he has had a routine behavior and predictability in the fact that he lives between Mar-a-Lago in West Palm, uh, Florida, and uh, Bedminster, New Jersey, uh, uh, during other months, and occasionally early on, and uh, he was in in New York as well. Uh, but when he comes to Mar-a-Lago, for example. He plays golf regularly, and it doesn't take a, 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 a brain surgeon uh, to watch the news, to w- do very little work and determine that he's regularly appearing at golf courses and golfing when he's in Mar-a-Lago. So uh, predictability is the operative word that needed to be addressed here. And regardless of whether this was a quote unquote off the record or a last minute decision, a good risk and threat assessment that should have been conducted given everything that's happened up to this point would dictate that people know where he goes. And therefore, regardless of if it's last minute, if someone who is going to cause him harm, there's a good probability that they would lie in wait in a place that they could get access to him or easier access than, say, Mar-a-Lago itself. And that would be a golf so, course. Right. And so so one of the things that's been said is, well, he doesn't get the same level of protection as, the incumbent, as an incumbent president. But let's just say that's uh, OK. And I, I don't think it is, but we'll get to that. But let's just say for the sake of argument that the level of protection he gets is sufficient if the uh, security planning is done appropriately. So the level of protection he has, would that necessarily include, you know, sweeping the perimeter of the golf course before he's set to tee off? So that, for example, if you had a guy who was hiding in the bushes for some 12 hours uh, out, out, off the fifth hole, you would see that guy before Trump is on the course. I mean, you know, I understand you have personnel limitations that are different for an incumbent, for a non-incumbent president versus a incumbent president, but still just in terms of the protocols that are uh, adhered to, to make sure that the particular footprint is safe and has been scouted. Is that, is that fair? Should that have been part of what Secret Service did? Absolutely. I think it should have been, especially where we sit right now in September, September of 2024, following the previous assassination attempt only two months ago. A- absolutely. He's a he's the major party candidate for president. And regardless of whether he's commander in chief and doesn't come with certain military assets that fall under the presidential protective detail, uh, the threat level is high. I can see it from where I sit in the private sector. And so, again, uh, off the record or not, he goes to these golf courses. He owns them. So that pre-advanced activity that should have occurred, those sweeps that you that you mentioned, absolutely should have occurred. And after those sweeps, they should have been posted with either agents or police officers that then held a post. If if Ryan uh, R- Ruth was sitting there for 12 hours, as as has been reported in, in the media, he would have been detected at that time during those sweeps, and then and then that perimeter would have been held further out to keep anybody that maybe would try to come up last minute to try to get into that shrubbery in those bushes to try to engage in the same type of conduct that Ryan Ruth did. Yeah, it's interesting because Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said, you know, I played that course with Trump before. And as soon as I heard the story about some activity at the course, I thought, well, that fifth and sixth hole, I know that's a vulnerable area. I mean, you know, obviously DeSantis is not an expert in in in, in, in security planning, but he's He's got a lot of experience having a security detail. And so he maybe, you know, he looks at it a little bit. He says, you know, that's an area that's definitely a vulnerability on the course. And even a layman like DeSantis could suss that out. It's it's um, sort of difficult to understand why Secret Service didn't. Yeah, it, it's, it's because they haven't assigned and looked at it with the correct amount of resources that they need to, given the th- current threat profile that exists against former President Donald Trump, in my so, opinion, again. So so how does that work? Because not only do we have Butler two months ago, but we've had a, you know, in the last uh, six to 12 months, we've had a Chicago woman arrested making threats against both Trump and Barron. 
we've had a Texas woman arrested uh, traveling uh, in the direction of where she thought Trump would be and making threats. Um, we've had a Pakistani a national arrested uh, that was um, plotting general potential targets for assassination, including Trump. Trump was specifically mentioned, although he didn't have a plan sketched out. We understand. So, I mean, you know, that seems to me a lot of law enforcement interaction with threats uh, that are directed at President Trump that just, again, commonsensically, you say, well, we're going to provide this guy, you know, basically the maximum protection that we can, because in this political environment and what we're seeing in terms of the real the reality on the ground, we, we have to do that to be uh, to err on the safe side. Yeah, it, I think part of the problem here too, Dan, is um, the Secret Service has spent decades, they do overall, the protection methodology is great. The problem is though, they've allowed themselves to fall into these silos of protective details. And what I mean by that is you have the president's detail, you have the vice president's detail, you have a former president, whoever's detail, and based and overall based on that, they assign X amount of resources and, and uh, human human resources as well as technical resources to those details. They have to break outside of that that bubble and that government bureaucracy funding model that well, the president's detail gets this many dollars. The former president only gets this many dollars. That, I think that's part of what's lagging behind here. And and to hear the comments about this is a we want to get out of the reactive model. That's kind of the mentality then that it's broken and it needs to be proactive and you need to address threats, period, threats. When I was in the Secret Service uh, uh, shortly after 9-11, there, there was a major threat against former President Carter. And, and given the, the, the attitude now, I mean, if something even happened to former President Carter at this juncture, it, it would be catastrophic, especially with what psychological boost it gives our foreign enemies across the globe just to see that they could come in here and, and, and take out, you know, a, a protected person from the United States Secret Service or the United States government. Yeah, right. I mean, it seems like, right, there's not any discussion of this is an agency that's got to be nimble, that's got to be resilient, that has to be proactive, as you say, but also has to be uh, flexible enough to adjust according to the reality on the ground. What we thought was a threat but um, we have something that was unanticipated here. So we need to be nimble and, and react very quickly to that, it would seem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and part of it, need, there needs to be some additional forward thinking, I think, under the current threat environment is historically the Secret Service obviously relies heavy on um, partnerships with local and state and other federal agencies. They do have a great working relationship. Part of the problem, though, is there's not really a funding mechanism in place for local and state agencies to support the Secret Service. So in a typical non-campaign year, you have, uh, you know, somebody comes in for a visit, maybe it's a, it's a once a year visit that the president comes in and the local agencies can kind of weather that uh, overtime cost that they have to pay officers to come in and things like that. But, but what we're talking about here right now is the Secret Service is short on uh, what was referred to when I was there as manpower, the human resource portion of this. And you can't bring enough human resources in at this juncture to get through backgrounds, to be trained, uh, to then understand the job, to you know, to understand the playbook, uh, to get in there. So you have to then start to rely on those additional resources. And I think some of that funding mechanism that they need to identify needs to go then to pay some of these state and local law enforcement to supplement them and, and more rigorously train with them because there's very competent police departments out there. And if they spend the time training with them, they can work to try to mitigate some of this uh, and extend those perimeters of security that need to exist. I mean, th this, uh, this event the other day in, in uh, Palm, uh, West Palm was unacceptable in terms of the proximity that we allowed this potential threat to get to. There needed to be additional perimeters of security. Off the record or not, it, it didn't matter. The threat profile against Donald Trump is too high. I mean, again, I don't have access to all that anymore. I can see it from where I sit these days. So it, 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 I just don't understand it. Right. So so Roe talking about personnel and he also mentioned, you know, we uh, we he, he mentioned training essentially, too, because he was saying we want the, the the most highly trained counter snipers. We want them to be sort of, you know, 
uh, military grade, uh, you know, Chris Kyle type sharpshooters. Uh, and but so as he's saying that, I'm saying, well, so what's happened? How, if the Secret Service has indeed atrophied, both in terms of uh, headcount as well as expertise, then then how, how exactly has that happened? Why, why are we talking about the need for these additional agents, the need for additional training for counter snipers um, at this juncture? It, it, it The problem is, you know, part of the problem here, too, is it's a law enforcement agency. It, it's not a business, not a corporation that's run by somebody with with true uh, business acumen and, and understanding, um, being able to look at a long term strategic plan and understand uh, where competition for jobs is going, uh, where, you know, who are we going to be able to retain? Are we going to be able to pay them enough? Are they going to be able to, um, uh, you know, go, go through this training physically? Can we spend enough money on training to make sure training is in fact required and not just something we put in our policy manuals that we should re receive training X amount of months per year, but then we don't really do it because we're shorthanded. So atrophy is a good word and, 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 it, and it's unacceptable. But these are things that have been problems for decades. And, and, it, and so there was the ability to foresee uh, these things as time went on. And, and especially uh, when, when Donald Trump took office the first time, we can see some of the reaction and the vitriol that exists out there in the public. And so the tea leaves needed to be read as to what the future may hold and, and, the, and the type of resources that need to be put in place before we have incidents happen and we're in this reactive model. How much has the politicization of hiring impacted Secret Service? I mean, even if you just from the outside and maybe obviously former colleagues you work with, your, your perspective on it, because, um, you know, we saw the incidents at, uh, at Butler and, uh, you know, some of those, and this was now, Admittedly, I, I think a lot of this was Department of Homeland Security officers and not technically Secret Service. So I, I want to distinguish. But I mean, it speaks to the larger problem of hiring based on we need to have X number of women and X number of people, this group and that group, rather than we need to have the, uh, uh, you know, the most uh, capable uh, agents possible. Um, you, you, you just you just wonder if the, the personnel is not of the quality it could be because you're factoring in things that have very little to do with aptitude and and professionalism. Absolutely, this this is not a career, you know. Nor is the military, um, nor are some of the other federal agencies, even st state and local law enforcement agencies, where we should have anything less than a, a meritocracy based, uh, you know, program of recruitment and training, and, and meeting those standards. Uh, I, you know, I was a physical. Doesn't look like it anymore. I've been out of it for a long time, but. But I was a, one of the uh, PT uh, coordinators for the agency when I was there. I mean, they're supposed to be training uh, or, or testing new recruits as they come in and then maintaining that program. And it, 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 it's a roller coaster ride always. You get into certain times where, hey, we don't, we don't have the time to do it, so we don't do that. Well, complete, that's, that leads us on that path to complacency and problems. And, and then eventually other things become more important because of political influence or whatever it is, these, these, these uh what we look like and, and, you know, what we ascribe to and things like that is very dangerous, extremely dangerous. So, um, how, you know, one of the questions about uh, what happened at Trump International Golf Course there, that attempt is, you know, how does this guy um, know that Trump is going to be there? Particularly, be, I mean, even whether it was on his public schedule, whether it was on his schedule and that this was, uh, uh, you know, knowable or not. But particularly because it wasn't, and the, and the excuse is given, you know, we had to do a, a sort of a reaction because he decided to play golf, and this was seemingly like a last minute thing. So it even calls more into question the idea. Okay, well, from is is there is there a leak in Secret Service? Is there a leak in the Trump campaign? You know, what was the circle of people who knew he was going to be on the course at that particular time, particularly to give uh, that would be assassin as much time as he had to lie in wait. And so, you know, what is your confidence level? Now let's bring in this other agency called the FBI. What is your confidence level that the FBI is going to get to the bottom of that and provide whatever they do find uh, to the public at large? Well, I, you, you know, I'll start with the with the last question. Um, I and many others of my vintage that have retired from the federal government and not just Secret Service, I have 
former FBI colleagues, DEA, HS, you, you name it. There is an uncomfortable uh, fear factor in, in all of us as, as to what's kind of become of some of these agencies. And, and I don't think any of us, as we've sat around and had coffee and discussed what happened, this wasn't the way it was when I was there kind of comments. Um, so the, co the confidence does wane. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, 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 it concerns me, especially when you take in the totality of some of the things we've observed um, over the last many years. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the, the cases that have been made, the, the efforts that are, that are going, at, going after you know, Donald Trump in certain ways, um, there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there as well when you've got an agency that's part of you know trying to make some of these cases then investigating uh these threats i mean that's that's just an objective comment from somebody who's done both investigations and protection my whole life that there needs to be accountability and transparency and i'm not sure under the circumstances um in the last few years that that's achievable uh, in, a, in a in a transparent way i guess um so, so that is a concern, um, you know, and I, and I think uh, bottom line, I think historically, a lot of that needs to be reevaluated uh, in, in terms of accountability. I mean, we, we stick in those silos again. FBI has the memorandum of understanding to investigate these. It's understandable. And there's good, you know, again, in every agency and there remains, there, there remains committed patriots and people that are, are dedicated to what they do. They believe in the Constitution. They believe in the, the oath they actually took. Um, but it can, it's very dangerous as to when that power gets corrupted at the higher levels and how that influence can can grab a stranglehold on whether agencies are doing the right thing or not at the at the lower levels. Well, right. And I would think that law enforcement would be particularly sensitive to this, because if there is not a public accounting for what went down. And this is actually a point that Thomas Baker made when I interviewed him, who is the first FBI agent on scene and and the point man for the investigation into the failed assassination attempt by Hinckley on Reagan. And he said, you know, we gather the evidence, we put together our understanding of the case. Tim McCarthy says the same thing, former Secret Service, took a bullet for Reagan. Um, and, and then we, once we thought we had an understanding of what happened and why it happened best as we could, we started to make the case to the public. And so you can ask us questions, you can disagree with our conclusions, you can say we missed something else, but at least we're saying we've, gathered all the evidence. We think we have this uh, uh, understanding of, of what transpired and why it did and how it went about and what we learned from it. And it's there for public consumption, discussion and debate. That seems to be not something we're getting anymore. And it breeds conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories don't make the job of law enforcement any easier. No, that no, you're you're absolutely correct, and and these these devices don't help either. I mean, they're working against the speed of light. And messages are right. out there, and people start communicating all this stuff. It, it, what was very apparent and should have been apparent to everybody was look at the difference between uh, a couple of days ago after the incident in Florida and and the Butler, Pennsylvania incident, where we heard nothing. We we received no press briefings, no critical incident updates. But all of a sudden, this one. It wasn't quite immediate. We got a little bit from the local sheriffs, which was great. Right. And then, right. but then we did get it from the feds. And that, that is, that's kind of security incident planning 1001. Um, it was shocking that, that, that wasn't something that was on the radar after Butler. And so that time lag does then, especially when we have people out there that can talk about all these other things, it does start to breed that conspiracy aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I think overall, you know, in this case, and I was glad to see, um, and I'm not saying that the FBI is not going to do its job or anything like that, but I'm glad to see that the local sheriffs and maybe even the governor of Florida is stepping in to try to um, be a part of that. And I, and I think they should be allowed into that to, to, to gain that confidence of that transparency and accountability that, hey, it's not, the feds aren't, you know, closing, you know, it's kind of like elections when we seal up windows and don't let certain people see what's yeah. going on inside right. we end up with conspiracy theories or, or, you know, or there's a reason for it and, and right, you know, rightfully assumed. Um, so I think it's important right now, given everything that's going on, uh, that there's an overt effort made um, to bring in other people to kind of audit or uh, ensure the governance and the transparency of some of these processes. Yeah. I think it's the, the DeSantis saying like, we're going to do our own state level investigation because there are state laws 
that were violated too. And so he can bring, uh, or, you know, prosecutors can bring their own law enforcement action against this would be assassin. Um, and, but you know how government is too. I'm very interested to see how that plays out because people, you know, get very territorial. They like to protect their fiefdoms. And, you know, and it's despite the fact that one of the lessons we were supposed to have learned after 9-11 was that federal, state, local government, particularly in law enforcement, need to be able to communicate with one another. And here we are just uh, marking the 23rd anniversary of 9-11, and we still have this problem. And we saw this problem at Butler, too, where, you know, the, 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 the guy in charge of making sure the radios uh, between uh, Secret Service and local are, you know, are work, are uh, inter, inter, interoperable. Well, they, they weren't, I mean, we, you know, how do we have these problems? You know, people look at this and say all this, you know, high minded rhetoric about here's what we're going to do. And we learned these lessons. And then decades later, you have incidents where it's the same problem that rears its head. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, and, you know, and that, you know, we, that gets back a little bit into the whole resource, uh, allocation things, you know, where some of the things you'll hear from the Secret Service about whether they should be in Treasury, whether they should be in DHS. There, I mean, there's literally, it, it it never really improved. Did it get a little bit better? Maybe. Um, the Secret Service definitely has good relationships with local and state, overall good with other federal agencies. But the federal agencies compete like like it's a competition for those dollars out there from, from Congress. And, you know, somebody, and I'm not, I'm not, casting stones, but the FBI is a much larger agency, has the ability to put a lot of agents literally on Capitol Hill as literally lobbyists to assist on certain things, whereas the Secret Service doesn't have that that bandwidth to be able to do something like that. So when you need people out there really selling why we need more budget and things like that, um, you, you don't have that. And, and, and unfortunately, we end up having to try to react to it when, when bad things happen, which, which shouldn't be the case. Um, that the, this should be proactive and, and preventative, not not reactive. Um, so I'll let you comment if you. Yeah. Want that, well, I mean, I mean, so I so just thinking about all this too. Now, um, as you say, that uh, distinguishing between the public response and the the speed of it after what happened this past Sunday versus uh, what happened on July thirteenth in Butler, Pennsylvania. Yeah, uh, that's good. But but then I, I it gets me thinking about Butler, Pennsylvania. And two months later, how little handle we really have about what went down, who made the decisions or failed to make the decisions, who uh, whose responsibilities were not fulfilled. We don't really have that, but we have what we have is in advance of this report that's supposed to be forthcoming shortly, senior level Secret Service people are going to be retiring and we have, you know, sort of general accountability that will be. Uh, accepted so that no individual accountability needs to be ascribed. So nobody individually needs to be held accountable, except for these guys that'll you know, get brushed to brushed over to, to retire or a year or two early. I mean, that's not, we, we, we don't know that much about the shooter. We don't know exactly why they um, prevented his body from being autopsied. I mean, all these questions that surround what the events of July 13th and the FBI has provided very little public commentary about that two months two months later. Yeah, it, it, again, because information, unlike, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, when something like this happened, information, again, moves at that speed of light. And law enforcement has to realize you have to get out in front of this. Um, and, and they do have to change their processes. And, and, and there's no reason under the... Uh, given the circumstances of a potential assass or not potential two assassination attempts that there shouldn't be a process in place to investigate these immediately i mean we you can throw enough resources at that to get 90 percent of your case done the qu the next question is are, are we actually making the case to have successful prosecution because that's part of we have to preserve evidence we have to make sure we don't t you know taint the evidence or the chain of custody and there's things like that but we can comment to some of this because the public interest is at play here too. And not only that, more importantly, I would argue right now, public safety, going back to maybe the importance of having the state, uh, like, like the state of Florida, or in this case, or, or the sheriff's office involved at the table for this investigation is the general public is potentially being put at greater risk when, when these protectees are, are coming into the area that, that they're at. Um, 
you know, un unfortunately, the sad, you know, death of Corey yeah, Comprator right. in Pennsylvania. Yeah. It, it, you know, so a sheriff or a state official does have some obligation to uphold their own uh, public safety if if somebody is coming in that you know to some degree brings the potential for risk at a heightened level to them, and, and so th they can't be closed out of that process. And I think you know bridging that those relationships a little bit more would be helpful, you know, especially in light of potential you know conspiracy theories and you know and things like that uh, to get multiple agencies at the table. Um, you know, contrary to what, what, like what you said, what we expected after 9-11. Well, and, and because uh, in Butler, in the wake of the failed attempt in Butler, you had finger pointing going on. You had the Secret Service director at the time more or less insinuating that it was the Butler police that fell down on the job. And then Butler police are saying the hell we did. And you have body cam video of a Butler police officer, you know, days after the, uh, uh, after the, the near miss. I mean, the hit, but the, you know, the, the near miss in terms yeah. of taking the president out um, is saying, I told these guys, I told these guys. And and when you have that sort of um, excited uh, exhortion in the moment that captured on a body cam video, you know, Butler police chief combined with Secret Service leadership needs to, it seems to me, come forward and, and offer an explanation for what happened and at, uh, on whose watch it happened, and here's what we're gonna do about it, and here's what we learn from it. I mean, you know, it's like the whole thing. The American people are forgiving, but not if you're going to, you know, lie and obfuscate at every turn, and that's that's really what it feels like is going on here. I, I agree with you, Dan, and um, the, there, there, is, there is an unfortunate, uh, drive by certain people, yes, to, to, to want to not just own mistakes. Humans make mistakes. They do. There's no, there is no perfect security plan out there. There's no perfect right. cybersecurity plan. No fit. So it, it is troubling that they can't come forward and learn from that. I, I will say I, I was a little disappointed back when I was on the job. I was actually there the day former Vice President Dick Cheney shot uh, uh, the gentleman down in Texas. And that was an unusual event. We didn't train. Yeah. For a situation yeah. where your protectee shoots somebody, so but there was a, <laughs> there was literally a lot to be learned after that incident that those of us that were there could have been tapped into more to help train or provide better post incident or after action briefings to train the next generation of agents or law enforcement for. Geez, we we didn't think of this one, but here here's what happened. Here's what went good. Here's what didn't go good you know, and learn from that. There, there wasn't enough of that. And it, it's, it needs to happen. Um, one of the, that, one that of the lessons is, ago. one of the lessons is don't go bird hunting with Dick Cheney. That was one of the uh, after action <laughs> lessons, right? Um, yeah, but no, but it, it is interesting because I, you know, one of the things too is, is, um, you know, outside of maybe Clint Eastwood in, in the line of fire, you know, you don't really have an idea of what Secret Service does on a daily basis. I mean, you know, generally people know generally they, they, they investigate forgeries and they cyber crime and obviously the protectees and this. But I mean, you don't really have a sense of what they do in the same way, maybe just through the, the popularization uh, through through uh, TV and movies that FBI or military do. And, and I, I wonder you know, maybe you could describe it being there two decades. You know, I mean, what, what is the job of the Secret Service on a daily basis? And what, what are those interactions like with uh, state and local, with the protectees themselves? We've heard about relationships between, you know, different people on different details with different presidents or other protectees. But I just like, the, you know, an insight into the culture at Secret Service, the job of Secret Service, you know, all of that, it's, it's, it's definitely more murky than some of the other uh, law enforcement agencies. Sure. Uh, one, one of the things I usually say, and I noticed you didn't mention it, uh, Dan, was you mentioned in the line of fire, but you didn't mention guarding tests with Nicholas Cage. Oh, yeah, uh, right. Which, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I often joke with, I often joke with people that want to go on the job is the protection environment, contrary to what we've seen this year, is a little bit more like the movie guarding tests. It's standing <laughs> around, it's complete boredom, you know, things like that. But uh, honestly, the, uh, the job is actually very rewarding. It's very difficult. Uh, one of the big things I think that needs to be changed is this emphasis on moving 
people around the country on a regular basis to, to promote or to get into another office or to go to this. I think, I think that needs, I think that's part of what's been a problem for many decades. Um, but aside from that, the opportunity to have that dual mission and, and there's people out there that say it, they should completely do away with investigations and they, it should be protection only. That's great. But you talk to a lot of people and I have, and I continue to even newer agents that are on the job right now, that it's because of the protection portion of it that they want to leave the job because it's too demanding. It's too, they stand around other than what we've seen this year, the majority of the time you're spending uh, an eight hour shift standing in front of a, a door doing nothing, trying to stay awake, trying to, you know, keep your mind uh, sharp. Uh, you might be on a midnight shift trying to stay awake as you're trying to do that and remain vigilant. Um, every once in a while you get to go out and be a part of an advanced team. And that's fun because you get to do the planning. You're responsible for that. Uh, it, the Secret Service, because of these relationships, both in its investigative and its protective mission, that was one of the greatest things about the job is the ability to go and meet people from all walks of life, be it military, business, you know, any city, any part of the world, and work with them, usually when it meant protection, in a very short order to, to put together a security plan, achieve the mission, you know, and, and hopefully walk away with no incidents. Uh, that's a big part of it. So you need people that can communicate and interact um, at that full enterprise level concept, so to speak, if this was a if this was a company we were talking about, you need individuals that can go and interact with that C-suite level because a lot of these protectees, the, you know, the presidents and the former presidents, they're going to these places that they visit. So you need people that can, that can talk, talk, you know, with them and, and, and carry on that professionalism. The investigations itself um, were, were, were great. And, and because of the reliance on those relationships with say state and locals. So for example, I, I ran our, our, what's called now what the secret service is called now it's called the cyber fraud task force when i was there it was the electronic financial and electronic crimes task force so i ran that for the state of minnesota on behalf of the office of minneapolis so i worked greatly with all kinds of different agencies that was important because it was those same agencies where we're working a lot of these criminal cases that then become our partners when a protective visit comes in and so you have those instant contacts to in relationships to be able to call up and say hey president's coming can you can we you know do x y or z or you've built relationships with the police officers so you know there's a trust there you can you, you know you can trust because that's that's always a fear that the secret service doesn't want to admit to and that's part of the reason they put people through extensive backgrounds is we got to make sure that there's not somebody that you know has an issue with this protectee and is going to do something you know that that's always on the back of your mind um but so so that whole that whole uh, relationship thing is really at the core of everything they do, both investigations and protection, and one feeds into the other. The, the part of my view on the problem of doing protection only is th it's literally a roller coaster. Campaign years are out of control. They're massive. You're, you're going to spend a majority of your time as a Secret Service person on the road traveling, deal going from campaign site to campaign site. Uh, but then in those off years, there's not as much travel. So if you have all these agents on the job, and that's part of what the Secret Service has struggled with over the years, I think with not staffing up appropriately, is it's those off years then. Well, now what do we do with people? We've got all these human resources. We don't have enough protection going on. Well, that's when they should be training. That's when they should be training with locals and state and, and have those you know good opportunities and, and all these other things that need to take place on a more regular basis um, or working these investigations that then continue to build those partnerships. Secret Service has always expected investigations to be dropped and put aside when protection has, has, in theory, always come first. I'll pause for a minute in case you have any, you know, comments, Dan. Just on the relationship with FBI, you know, I mean, one of the big questions, recurring questions in this era of uh, unprecedented lawfare is who investigates the investigators, who prosecutes the prosecutors, you know, where are the accountability mechanisms for these federal agencies that have so much law enforcement police power effectively. And so the relationship between FBI and Secret Service, since FBI is investigating Butler, now they'll be investigating West Palm and those assassination attempts. Um, you know, is this is this a relationship that is uh, competitive? Is it antagonistic? Is it closer to you get you cover my back and I'll cover your back? Um, you know, how much confidence should the American people have in what the FBI 
uh, determined did and did not happen with respect to these assassination attempts? So the, the relationship actually is really honestly dependent on the individuals and the individual uh, district, state, the relationships that say in this recent example that Miami agent in charge of the FBI and the Miami agent in charge of the Secret Service, if they've got a good relationship, you know, th there's, there's going to be some good trust there. I don't think it's, I've never really seen it like we're, we're, we're all locked arm in arm. There's definitely, you know, some level of, you know, there always has been, a, and I say it more in a friendly competition for budgets, for resources, for jurisdiction, uh, investigative uh, jurisdiction. I, I mean, I saw it, I was, I was part of it. Um, and, um, but I, I don't know how to honestly answer uh, your question about should we trust what's going on now? Because I've seen the same things a lot of the American people are seeing it that are, you know, using discernment and, and studying what's gone on. And not only me, but agents that have worked in those agencies have seen it. And we've talked about that when I, like I mentioned to you earlier, there is concern and, and, and but we're not sure what we're concerned about because it, it just doesn't look the same. And well, that's, you know, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of the point is like, is, you know, the, 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 to simplify the question is, you know, are, are we going to get something that's on the level or is getting something on the level? Is that just not going to happen anymore until and unless there's this paradigm shift or leadership change that Ron Rowe was talking about? I, I, the good news is, and this is the, one of the things that was done right many, many years ago after the Kennedy uh, assassination was the Secret Service est did establish this memorandum of understanding with the FBI that Secret Service can't investigate itself when it comes to an assassination attempt or an assassination. It, it could have been an inside job. So for that reason, you do need that, that ob objectivity and that outside um, avenue. I think given a lot of what's going on, and I follow a lot of different things on social media and understand what some of the concerns are out there in, in all both sides of the spectrum is the importance of some additional accountability and transparency that needs to happen right now with these federal agencies. I think with either an additional government agency at the federal level or uh, potentially the state state partners, and they need to be brought in. I think that's would help and go a long ways with uh, putting some people's minds at ease that 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 this is a you know a fair thing. I, personally, I think what we've witnessed. Uh, between Butler, Pennsylvania, and the other day in, in West Palm uh, Beach, Florida, it, it is a combination of growing incompetence, lack of resources, um, and, and we've always done it this way. You know why? Why? You know why did we need to change? And there's never been there hasn't been an attempt in forever. It didn't happen during my watch. I mean, it, it didn't happen while I was on the job. You know, we came close to the opposite to protect the almost shot an in, you know, an innocent person, but there was no assassination attempt. There are a lot of incidents that happen on a daily basis that people are never aware of where we get close, but they're mitigated and deterred. So, but I, I think, um, I think given everything that's gone on there, there needs to be a, a heightened level of, of accountability, um, under the current conditions for us all to feel I, good. Just before I let you go, just to go back to West Palm beach, the, uh, one of the other questions I, I failed to ask earlier, what we know about that alleged would be assassin who is now in custody and been arraigned. Um, should he have been on Secret Service's radar with everything that we know about him publicly profiles in The New York Times, a self-published book on Amazon that talks about assassinating President Trump, you know, talks favorably about it. Um, the, uh, the 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 the, the interviews that he gave associated with going over and, and trying to be essentially some sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, white knight for the Ukrainians and, and, and going to the, the, the front, although I don't think he ever did based on what we know. His criminal, his criminal record, he's a convicted felon, a machine gun was one of the felonies, theft in his background, so on and so forth. You know, all of that, does that, I mean, I, you know, I think people, again, uh, reasonable in the sense like uh, you, you must get like information and tips uh, about a thousand cooks, cooks an hour around the country, you know, targeting one person or another or saying disparaging things about one person or another that you have to sift through. So I, I'm not saying this is not a leading question. I'm not saying he should have been. I'm asking the question. It's like, try, when does the manifest weight of the evidence clear the threshold to say we got to we got to like keep an eye on this guy? So 
Uh, it's a great question and it's extremely important under the circumstances because we don't know yet if he was the only one involved. I have True. those questions given his background that you just cited. And, and if, if we're not looking at who did he make contact with while overseas, is anybody behind getting him back here to carry out his little mission he was on on Sunday? Uh, that's an important piece of this. Should he have been on the Secret Service's radar? Absolutely. If, if he has ever named any protectees, um, in, in any violent way. And if you look at conducting a true behavioral or threat assessment on somebody like him, you just rattled off a lot of the major red flags, Dan. This guy has shown a propensity for violence. He's gotten into standoffs with law enforcement. There's probably a degree of mental health issues. I, I myself was able to see, assuming it was you know not some sort of artificially in, produced um, LinkedIn profile of a rambling message, which is usually indicative of mental health issues. He's traveled overseas. He's he's been with uh, weapons. All of these things are massive red flags that usually uh, raises somebody that's made threats to Secret Service protectees to, to our highest level within our protective intelligence uh, methodology, where, where, we're, where we're looking to monitor those kinds of things. What concerns me even more on this is, was he on somebody else's radar? Was he, was he on the radar of the FBI? Were they looking at it from a from a global perspective that he had been over there in Ukraine trying to recruit people over there. He's not a member of the military. And did they know he came back here? He, he had to hit travel lists when he when he flew back into the country from from over there. So was he under any type of observation or surveillance? And if so, when he showed if he was when he showed up in Florida, were people notified of this? You know, because that goes to forget the off the record movement. If if another agency is tracking somebody that's a potential threat and now they're here in Florida, and I'm speaking obviously hypothetically. I don't want to suggest that that that, that happened here. And if it didn't, it's actually kind of a sad case that it, that it didn't. But um, that would change the 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 approach, uh, whether you're going out on an off the record move to a golf course or not. If if somebody you know, especially if they don't know exactly where they're at, um, but they might be in the city. So um, it, it somebody like Ryan Ruth should be on the radar. Uh, it's very difficult though. A lot of people think. You know, then we get into the whole surveillance issues and Fourth Amendment rights, constitutional rights of individuals. To, you know, um, if there's not an ongoing, continuing need that can be articulated and demonstrated, or an open investigation on an individual because they do pose a potential ongoing threat, then it's difficult for law enforcement to, you know, continue to track and do things and not be in violation of our constitution. No, absolutely. And, and this is exactly why, like, all these questions need substantive answers, because whatever the answer is, and then the explanation, then we can have a discussion about it. And, and, and it could be like a learning moment for a lot of the American public, which wouldn't be a bad thing either. So um, no, I, I'm, well, we'll see. Uh, looking forward to more questions being asked, and hopefully some being answered in the coming days. Mike Olson, veteran, Secret Service agent, now retired, and uh, operating a security firm that he co-founded called 360 Security Services. Mike, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. We appreciate your insights. You're welcome, Dan, anytime. Appreciate you having me. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And please leave a comment in the comment section. We'd love to hear your thoughts.